So the time is coming. Our next presenter is Christopher Travis, PostgreSQL data recovery on a damaged file system. He doesn't speak Russian, so please ask your questions in English or in Russian for the interpreter to interpret the question. Um, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so, um, the, this talk is about uh, data recovery um, in Postgres, and this is a topic almost all of us hope we never have to deal with. But the fact of the matter is that sometimes bad things happen, and sometimes going through the um, efforts to recover data can deliver some unexpected benefits. In the case we're going to talk about today, um, the actual act of trying to recover the data, in fact, successfully, um, showed us far more about the failure that happened and what we could do to prevent it in the future than we would have gotten from any other means. So um, we'll talk about uh, what data recovery means, um, why we do data recovery, the actual process that we used in terms of recovering data in this case, and um, sort of the takeaways that you can, that, that you can, um, uh, sort of the, the lessons you can take away and apply if you're ever in a situation where things have gone seriously wrong. Now, if you are, if you haven't gotten yet a deep uh, introduction to the internals of Postgres, the big thing that you'll get out of this talk is what data recovery is and what it isn't and how to think about interacting with people maybe you contract to do the data recovery itself. If you are digging deep into the internals, then um, hopefully this talk will help you think more clearly about how to actually recover data in the event where you have to, um, in the event where you actually have to try. So we'll talk, this is an actual case study, it's something that happened to us, and um, we'll talk about uh, the specific, um, the, the specific um, steps and, and such. So uh, first, a little bit about me. I had the database team at Adjust. We do mobile advertisement attribution. Uh, we have probably close to 10 petabytes of data in Postgres. We do some crazy stuff that most other people wouldn't do in their sane mind, um, but we find Postgres actually is, is probably the database that, that we have the most trust in of, of everything. Um, I've de I delivered a different talk here last year about uh, one of our data environments. Um, as a show of hands, did anybody attend that talk of mine last year? Not many? Okay. Um, so, I've worked with Postgres since about 1999 in, in various ways. Um, the company I work for, we do uh, basically attribution of, of, of advertising events. So we say this advertising um, event gets credit for this installation. So we get a very large amount of data and we have to process it. And basically this is the context in which all of everything in this talk happens. So our databases tend to be under reasonably heavy load. We process 100 to 300,000 transactions a second across our entire environment um, in terms of the basic analytics side. And we have other components that do uh, twice that. So so here again, we cover what data recovery is, what it isn't, um, what happened to us, and what you can learn from it. So I want to talk a little bit about what happened that put us in this situation. Back in the summer, we had an extremely unfortunate power event that hit um, a large portion of our servers. Um, this was a brownout followed by a blackout. Um, it was an extremely unusual, an extremely unexpected environment, and um, our services were down briefly. When we got them restored, um, some things didn't come up as expected, and we found ourselves in a situation where um, our systems, which had spinning disks on RAID 10, didn't behave the way we expected them to behave. Uh, I believe the failures happened in a RAID controller today. 
but uh, it, it's still a little bit up in the air. We never found any problems on flash storage, so this, is, this, this was an interesting side to this. We had file system damage on spinning disk, but not on flash storage, and um, as far as I could tell, both metadata and actual content seem to have been written to the wrong locations on drive. So probably during the brownout, some bits flipped in the RAID controller's memory and stuff got written to the wrong locations. So um, for anybody who was at my talk last year, the systems that we're looking at today were our point of entry servers. Uh, so these are the servers that do the processing, they log locally, and um, basically we use Postgres as a, as, a, as a log for these systems. They're highly redundant. At the time of this disaster, we had 24 of them online. Two of them were badly affected and we had to take them out of uh, circulation in order to assess and eventually correct this problem. Um, typically, in this case, we have our hot data, which is one or two terabytes on SSD, or in this case, NVMe, and the rest of our data is on the slower spinning disk, which until this point had largely worked okay. Um, so, everything comes back up, we see this error message. First thing you'll notice in this error message is it's saying that it can't find a file. It's kind of bad news. The second thing is that that last number in the file is very low, it's, it's under 10,000. This means that we're missing a system catalog file. So something's happened and the system catalog file's missing. We found these errors on two systems, so these are the two systems we pulled out of production. We started looking at this, we ran FSCK, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but basically, um, this happened on two of these systems and um, looking at this file, this turned out to be PG type. Sure. Uh, okay, so um, so as, as we looked at this, it turned out to be PG type that was missing. So first thing you do when you have file system damage is you run FSCK. On the first system, this took several hours to complete, and it tried to resolve a whole bunch of problems. We found something like um, 10,000 orphan files, and most of these, in fact, looked like uh, PG uh, relation files. Um, my first thought was to try to use PG file dump. Anybody here know what this is? Show of hands. Okay, so PG file dump is a program which will read a relation file and try to dump um, basic information out of it so that you can try to process it or understand what's in the file. Um, this, this didn't help us in this case. Um, I tried, I looked for this file, I found one file that looked kind of like it might be, I copied it into place and it didn't show anything. So that wasn't PG type, it didn't fix the problem, I moved it back out, we went back to square one. Now, the interesting thing about this is, um, or, or the difficult thing about this is we have a 20 terabyte database spanning two volumes. I can't just copy it over the network and work on a copy. So at this point I'm starting to work on a live system or, or a, my master copy of a system. Um, this is something we all like to avoid doing when we're doing data recovery, but you know, when you're in a bad situation, sometimes you have to be aware of when you're breaking best pra practices and do it anyway. So, next stop is, well, we're going to uh, restore from backup. Because when there's a disaster, that's always our first uh, implication, uh, our first instinct, and for good reason. Um, and backup recovery becomes part of our, our, our effort to recover from the system, uh, from this event anyway. But our backups are nightly backups, and we decide we're going to go ahead and try to recover the last eight hours of inserts. Nothing wrong with trying that, we might not succeed, but we're not going to do worse than our backups. So um, we could have 100 million rows here, 
um, no problem. We're, we're going to try to recover this data. So um, the other side to this is we don't like the way our backups work at this point. Our, our backups work, they, they provide enough data for us to um, continue business-wise. Um, in the event where we just have to recover the backup, we're not in a tremendously bad situation, but you know, it would be nice to have that other eight hours worth of data. If we ever have to backfill a metric, we will need it. Um, or maybe customers will see something funny and they'll ask us about it and um, at that point support won't know what to tell them. So <clears throat> we, uh, we decided we would go ahead and try. Um, but the other side to it is we decided to write a new backup system um, as one of the things that came out of this. And I know that doesn't completely fall in the flow of this topic, but this is one thing basically um, that's kind of important worth noting, is uh, we decided that our backup solution just simply wasn't good enough and we were going to write a new one that would actually tailor me, uh, fit our needs. Um, our, our new backup is basically it attaches as a logical um, replication client and it streams changes out. Um, and even without uh, PG Logical, we've been able to um, detect um, DDL changes and dump those changes and stuff like that. So we're working on a new backup tool. Uh, we expect it to be in production in the next couple of months. Um, and this will replace our nightly backups. Um, a lot of people would say, well, why don't you use streaming backups like uh, Barman or, or archive-based backups like um, PG Backrest? These systems generate so much wall a day that, that that's, a, that's just not practical for us. Um, there are two other countermeasures that might have been helpful in this case. And you always look at these things and you say, well, we should have done these two things. Um, and these, the, we identify two of them. Um, again, streaming backups of some kind, we're working on a logical version of that. Um, we expect that in production fairly soon. And if we had had um, check page, uh, checksums of pages, we would have had a little more confidence that, um, that the data um, on the rest of the system was usable. Um, we might have caught the problem earlier. So, <clears throat> this gets to the first really important uh, sort of non-technical point. Your biggest cost when you're doing data recovery is not the question of data loss in many cases, it's the question of downtime. Um, I mean, data loss can be very severe. Downtime can also kill you. So the first thing I did was I went to the head of ops and I said, how long can I have these systems down for? Because I don't want to have our business suffer because I'm trying to recover data that maybe isn't so important. And he said, well, you know, we're processing 25% ahead of normal right now. We're processing 400,000 requests a second. And these two systems are down. So keep them down for as long as you need them. Just try not to take too long. I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's good enough. But, but this is one of the very important things is that if you're facing a situation like this, figuring out how long you can have a system down for is really important. The next thing that's really important is figuring out what recovery means. What data do you want to recover, right? We all say we'd like to recover everything, but in a lot of cases like this, that's not practical. So you have to set realistic um, goals and you have to be prepared to walk away when things just aren't going to work right. So we looked at this and we said we want to recover the data on the SSDs. We don't believe there are problems there. Um, and we'll just restore from backup everything on the, on, on the spinning disks. So again, we couldn't copy this data over a network and work on a copy. Um, and data loss implications in this case are relatively narrow. It impacts our ability to new, do new things, but it doesn't really destroy our um, ability to continue our business. So it's really nice to have this data, but it's not the end of the world if we lose it. 
So this is nice, it takes the pressure off. And the next point I would say is don't do data recovery when you're under too much pressure. The reason being, we make mistakes, those mistakes can make things worse and eventually you can get into a situation which was far worse than where you started. So, <clears throat> here's the game plan. We have the systems down, we go through FS check, um, we're going to do a best effort at recovery, and uh, then we're going to restore the backups of the systems except the stuff that's on these SSDs and we'll try to recover that stuff. So at this point we've ordered four new systems, we put them into place, two of them will take the place of the two systems we have down, two more will be extra capacity, so this is fine, we're okay, we're running. Um, so at that point we've gone from 24 systems online before the incident to 26 online while I'm doing the actual recovery. So we're actually in pretty good shape. Um, so here are your basic ground rules when you're in a situation like this. Number one, you don't know how badly broken the system is. And no matter what you fix, you can't guarantee there isn't more stuff broken that you haven't seen. So this is an unknown state and it's a place where you just can't be sure that you ever get everything back perfectly working. So don't try. If you try this, you're risking your data long term. Don't do that. Um, the second thing is think about everything carefully before you do it. Make sure you understand what you expect and um, make sure you understand what, what to expect and make sure that if it does something you don't expect, that you circle back and you know, figure out what went wrong before you proceed. Um, secondly, don't be afraid to read the source. This came in handy in this case. Um, reason from internals to effects and the goal is to create a fake working system. Not a real working system, but a fake working system. And this is really, really important. <clears throat> So our general strategy was this. <clears throat> Recover the catalogs enough that we can re-index them and then dump what's on SSD. That's pretty straightforward, you'd think. But again, we don't know how badly broken the system is. Um, and I guess one other thing worth noting is if we go through this and say PG classes, missing or PG attribute is missing. It's going to be so much harder to recover those tables that we'd probably just walk away. So let's look at the, uh, the structure of the PG data directory because this, we know we have file system damage, we need to kind of figure out what we're doing <clears throat> and basically this is what it looks like in, under normal circumstances. Sorry. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about which, which ones of these were damaged in our first recovery and which one of them were damaged in our second recovery. Um, the structure of the base directory, here what you see is, is a series of numbers and then PG temp. Temporary files go in PG temp. Uh, one is template one. One, two, five, five, seven is template zero. When you do initDB, it creates template one and then backs it up to template zero. Um, one, two, five, five, eight is template, no, is Postgres, and then the, other, the, other will be, the others will be user-created databases. Just, um, and it's generally important to know these things when you're in this case because you can't guarantee you can pull the data out of, say, you know, pinned relation files or database um, uh, catalogs or things like that. So we start getting into this in, in the first recovery and it starts complaining that it can't find um, transaction log segments, the, the segments in PG exact. So 
In our workload, we commit almost everything. It's very rare that we see um, a transaction rollback, but it does happen. And we're going to decide, we're going to assume that every transaction file that's missing is just commits. We're going to assume that nothing rolled back in those that hasn't been vacuumed. So, um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll look at the, P, the structure of the PG um, exact files in a second. Um, using a hex editor, we located a file that was just commits, and then I just basically copied it everywhere we are missing one. So, the, inside the PG exact directory, you'll see a number of, of files that are, that are labeled like this, and they'll go uh, 0, 0, 0, 0 through FFFF. Um, the internal structure of one of these files, um, did I miss this? It looks something like this. The, this is a file which has multiple rollbacks. Um, the five, the double fives are just um, uh, all commits. But sometimes you'll see a different, uh, different code than a five, and that indicates something rolled back somewhere. Um, if we had something that was just uh, commits, the whole file would be 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, and it would be five, all fives here, and then a star, and then that line at the bottom. That's how you can determine that this perfectly good file we're going to, um, we're going to copy everywhere and possibly accidentally commit stuff that we had previously rolled back. So after three days, I got this first one up. We dumped the file. We were able to start recovery, feeling great. Go on to the second one. This point on the second one, FSCK has just completed. That's bad news, by the way. That means it took three days for FSCK to run. PostgreSQL.conf was corrupted. A whole bunch of binary data just in the middle of it. The entire PG exact directory was missing. Not just a, a transaction log or two, but the whole directory. Template zero was missing. And actually, I found out later it was template one. I, I learned the OIDs were, um, I had them backwards. But um, <clears throat> so template one was missing. And um, the whole table spaces directory was missing. There was significantly more damage. And this meant that I had to start actually at a very different point. I had to start by setting up my table spaces manually and setting up the links as they needed to be within that table spaces directory. And it took me three times to get it right. I started recovering twice, and I had to kill the process because I noticed it was writing files to the wrong location. Um, that was a bad thing. Um, but I got that set up and got it recovering. Um, we copied the known good uh, PG exact file everywhere. And then we were able to get, uh, get things uh, started up. Then we were able to start recovering stuff um, from, for the catalog. Uh, the approach to covering, recovering stuff from the catalog is actually fairly simple. You figure out which file you're dealing with and you copy it in from, um, from template one. Because at that point, you can get something that was like it was when you did the initial database creation. You might be losing some data, but you can often get enough there that you can proceed enough to dump the rest of the data. <clears throat> so we created a full PG exact with every possible segment copied in. Um, we copied from the Postgres DB instead of template zero or template one. So when we missed PG type, we copied that in. When we missed some of the indexes, we copied that in. Eventually, we were able to re-index. And instead of taking three days, it only took me three hours. So we learned a whole lot in that time. Mm. 
So um, on to the uh, bit about uh, technique and uh, what data recovery and the non-technical takeaways. Um, actually, these are both technical and non-technical takeaways. You're working on a system that you have no idea how broken it is. So under absolutely no circumstances do you put this back in production. This is just done enough to dump data off, then you get rid of the directory and you do it in a DB. Downtime is costly. So you work with all stakeholders to figure out what's required and how to meet their needs and you put that first because if you don't put that first then you're not aware of the other costs that are happening and um, problems are going to happen. On the other hand, if you're, in a if you're a stakeholder, you need to start thinking about how much downtime costs, what are your options, how are you going to, how are you going to have business continue, and those are, the, those are the things that are your role when you're working with somebody else who's doing that out of recovery. <coughs> Understand you might not succeed. We were lucky in this case. But if we had come across a missing PG class, we would have given up. So, <coughs> sorry. So always, <clears throat> always keep in mind that you might fail and have plans for that. <clears throat> because business continuity isn't just about getting your data back, it's about actually continuing your business, right? And the last point, and this is, there's a reason I put it in bold, is don't panic. We all find ourselves in cases where we're under a lot of pressure. And in those cases, the, it, it's really easy to panic. And when you panic, you lose your ability to troubleshoot and think creatively and figure out what you can do and what you can't do. And in those cases, people make big mistakes. And those big mistakes can cause a manageable problem to become an unmanageable problem. So, if in doubt, you slow down and you don't do something unless you're really um, calm and you're thinking of all these other uh, externalized consequences. Now, on the technical side, <clears throat> um, one of the sides to this was um, in figuring out the PG exact stuff. I actually had gone to the sources twice. And I'd gone to the sources enough to understand them, but I didn't use the sources as a reference to make a new PG exact file. Um, this was really helpful. Um, you go to the source when you need to. Um, but again, you're in, you're in a fog of war situation. You don't want to, um, you don't want to um, make a mistake that's going to cost you a lot of problems later. So, um, always err on the side of caution. Um, make sure you understand how things really work and the source is a great reference for that, but it's not the only thing you should be paying attention to. And again, the goal is to create a fake working system. Just fake enough that it can read your data for you and dump it into a file so you can put it somewhere where you have a real working system. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to open this up for questions. Um, I don't have a translation earpiece, so if there is a question in Russian, I might need somebody to translate it. Oh, there is? Okay, yes. perfect. Задавайте mm -hmm. вопросы. Any questions? Uh, thank you for discussing such an interesting theme. Uh, I have some questions about uh, dealing with the discussion, uh, the situation of failure mm -hmm. with, with the business departments mm -hmm. of the company. Sure. So just a mention. Uh, you did your best mm -hmm. and uh, there was a failure, mm -hmm. finally. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So, what kind of, uh, I don't know, conclusion, uh, proof in that, even so, uh, can one give to the business department in order to, pr in order to explain the failure and uh, just imagine uh, the business could, uh, could even say that uh, you are not you are not clever enough to recover the system, so it's your failure, not well, a real situation. Okay, so when we're in this situation, there's always been at least one or more um, failures that's happened along the way. Like in, in this case, we have backups, but they're not as good as we'd like. Maybe you're in a situation where the backups are bad. Um, th there are going to be multiple points of failure here. Um, the first thing is expectation management. You're in a bad situation already and you should be communicating to stakeholders that there's a significant chance that you won't be able to succeed. I mean, you don't know what the problem is when you're going into this and it's really important to communicate that. So in this case, imagine that PG class or imagine that the, the data we wanted to recover had been clobbered by random writes by the RAID controller and the data had been physically overwritten on disk. We wouldn't be able to recover it, right? So we have to communicate that up front and make sure that everybody's on the same page before we, um, before we set expectations and uh, have to go back and, 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 and address it that way. Thank you. Andrasite. Greetings. I don't speak Russian very well, therefore I will speak. Uh, I, I, I cannot speak English. You were not speaking about cut down of electricity for uh, solid bodies for uh, uh, spinning disks. I, imagine such disks are degraded. So does it mean uh, it means that uh, spinning disks were corrupted? And you were not speaking about the states of disks. Perhaps the blocks on disks are not read on a good speed. So perhaps the blocks of data were corrupted on the disks uh, in your case. So on the physics disks, was there a physical degradation of disks in your case? Um, we did not see physical degradation when we brought the systems up. However, one possibility is that you could have had physical degradation while the, while the, um, while the disks were spinning down. And so we can't, we can't rule out the fact that degradation could have been part of the actual failure, but we didn't see it after, after the systems came up. And after formatting the hard drives and putting things back into production, um, we haven't seen any more failures on these hard drives, so it, it doesn't look like a hard drive problem. It looks like, it looks like something related to the power of failure. Thank you. If you have more questions, no, oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Did you use um, the file systems were um, and ext4 respectively? Uh, did you use disk array? Mm. Which disk array or? Yeah, these are these are these are RAID hardware RAID. Uh, hardware RAID 10 on a disk array, yes. So, большое спасибо докладчик. Thank you very much for your thank you very much for your presentation.